Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a warm welcome uh, to all of you uh, for uh, a lecture tonight from uh, Professor Ian Shapiro uh, that will be entitled Democratic Competition, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Uh, this is uh, one of our, our events that we uh, call the Foreign Policy Forum, uh, and in the Foreign Policy Forum, we are especially pleased to thank uh, Daimler Funds for the generous support of uh, the series. Uh, that today brings us uh, Professor uh, Shapiro. Ian Shapiro is Sterling Professor of Political Science at Yale University, where he also serves as the Henry R. Luce Director of the Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies. He has written widely and influentially on democracy, justice, and the methods of social inquiry. A native of South Africa, Shapiro received his JD from the Yale Law School and his PhD from the Yale Department of Political Science, where he has taught since 1984 and served as chair between 1999 and 2004. I'd like to pause for a second, uh, perhaps uh, irresponsibly, uh, to riff for a second on this phrase, a native of South Africa, which is probably something you hear at virtually every introduction uh, that you're given. And what I'd like to indulge in just for one second may not only be uh, biographical determinism, uh, which is a certain kind of fallacy, but uh, banal biographical determinism, which is even worse. So I, I forgive me uh, and please rebut at any point uh, what I'm saying. But if you all have a chance to look at the description of Professor Shapiro's work on the website of the Yale Political Science Department, you'll find um, some very interesting observations. Uh, one of them is uh, his aversion to uh, what we often call theoreticism or theoretical paradigms that then need to be uh, supported through empirical evidence. Uh, and uh, it, it rather describes his method as starting with a problem. Uh, and it, it seems to me that if we think about a place like South Africa, uh, the idea of starting to think about politics, democracy, justice, and transformation uh, by starting with a very dense reality and a problem uh, is perhaps a very good example or even, or even uh, motivation. Uh, Ian Shapiro is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Philosophical Society, a member as well of the Council on Foreign Relations. His most recent books include The Real World, The Real World of Democratic Theory, Containment, Rebuilding a Strategy Against Global Terror, and the Flight from Reality in the Human Sciences, as well as the forthcoming Politics Against Domination. Uh, my understanding is that the current project is a co-author project, or will be a co-author project, with Professor Francis uh, um, uh, Rosenbluth. So please welcome uh, Professor Ian Shapiro. Uh, many of you know our uh, tradition here. Uh, the lecture will be followed by a question and answer period. Uh, please wait for a microphone to reach you for the benefit not only of the hall, but people uh, who are not physically present in the hall, but will be seeing the video. Uh, let us know very briefly uh, who you are, uh, and then try to have a question mark at the end of whatever, uh, whatever you say, uh, which uh, very often helps everybody in the room as well. So with that, uh, perhaps excessive instruction, Ian. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for uh, coming tonight. The talk that I'm giving is based on collaborative work with Francis Rosenbluth, my colleague at Yale, who is a political economist who works on uh, electoral systems, among other things. Um, the, the project that we are engaged in is, uh, is motivated by a paradox. And the paradox is um, that over the past three or four decades, we have seen across almost all of the democratic world a movement to bring democracy closer to the people by democratizing the operation of political parties, the making of political decisions, and the, the ongoing activities of political processes, all motivated by a, a sense of political alienation. Um, but the paradox is that as that has occurred, we've seen 
an increase in political alienation by just about any measure that you could come up with, whether it's uh, participation in political activities, whether it's turnout in voting, whether it's faith in electoral institutions or political parties or politicians. We've seen this, this revival of demand for more and more participation accompanied by increasing alienation from politics. Now, of course, there are plenty of reasons for people to feel alienated from politics. We have had, after all, uh, decades of increasing inequality and wage stagnation. We have had the financial crisis of a decade ago after which many thought of as the undeserving have been bailed out, whether it's the bankers who were thought responsible for the crisis or um, uh, voters and consumers in other countries being supported by uh, taxes from yet other countries, whether it is um, the proliferation of unpopular wars that have had knock-on effects of massive deficits and uh, refugee crises. Um, there are plenty of reasons for voters to feel alienated. Nonetheless, we think that there's a relationship between the two things that I, I mentioned first, namely the increasing demand for direct forms of participation in politics and the increased alienation uh, that we see fueling yet more demands in a kind of vicious cycle um, that, that becomes the source of its own discontent. And in contrast to um, many of the demands that are being made, the, our thesis is that actually two or big strong parties or predictable coalitions of parties are actually best. So um, if, if you want to think about a, a, a two by two, what used to be called the United, the, the, the Westminster system, where you have two big strong parties until they started messing up the British system for many similar reasons that have arisen everywhere, uh, we think is, is best. Where you have um, uh, multiple parties, as in northern European systems, because as a result of, of PR, we think that's less good. But then even worse is when you have weak parties. You, so in the US, we have two-party system, but very weak parties for reasons that I'll talk about. And then in East Europe and uh, Latin America, you tend to have parties that are both multiple and weak parties because of things like open list PR and other things that I'll mention. So those are the, the, the if you like, the universe of possibilities. And it's very important that we not only think about the number of parties, which is conventional uh, for commentators to do, but also the strength of parties. And I'll say more about what I mean by strength as we go on. But really what we're make, making the argument for is the importance of big, strong parties. Um, so, but let me first just flesh out a, a little bit what I mean when I say that um, there's a demand for um, greater democratization of political parties, political processes, and political decisions. So starting since the 1960s in the US, but in, in many other countries as well, we've seen a proliferation of devices for selecting candidates, primaries, caucuses, um, membership meetings, and so on, that, t that take control of the selection of candidates away from political parties and put them in the hands of uh, po popular decision makers, usually party members, or this, that subset of party members that tends to be highly active. And those people tend to be on the extremes of political parties. There has been a variety of devices to try and get better so-called descriptive representation, to get members of parliament who, or, the, or the Congress in the US who are more like the voters that they represent. So in the US, this has taken the form of majority-minority districts, <laughs> gerrymandering districts in order to get certain ethnic and racial groups represented. Um, but it's, it's another reason uh, that people often like PR, because it, it seems to produce a, a legislature that more reflects voters. 
There's been an emphasis on deliberation and other forms of direct participation for political decision making. Direct election of party leaders uh, by party memberships rather than um, by the um, congressional or, or um, legislative uh, party uh, that is, is being uh, led. The use of ballot initiatives, referenda and plebiscites. The preference, as I said, for PR over single member district systems. Single member district systems tend to give a, a small number of choices or even a binary choice to the voter, whereas PR you get the proliferation of parties and, and the Greens can find a party that suits them and the Social Democrats that suit them and the left that suits them and the AFD party that suits them. Everybody can feel that they have a representative in parliament that better reflects their views. Um, fixed parliaments, shortened uh, uh, term limits, these are all devices that have been uh, pressed in order to weaken the control of party leaderships over um, the decisions that parties make and, and the governments uh, that they form and what they can do while they're governing. Um, so this is, this is what we mean by weakening parties and political leaders. A strong party, by contrast, is a party in which the leadership has a great deal of freedom to design the political platform and agenda but always subject to uh, the, the constraint that if they don't deliver, they're gone. Uh, so if, if, you have, if you have a situation um, where the, lead, the leadership fails to deliver victories, then uh, the sanction is that the, that the backbenchers will quickly remove that leader and replace them with someone else. So what we call party discipline is really a situation where it's in the interest of the backbenchers to give a lot of authority to the leadership uh, to make the tough decisions that will hold the party together and give it the possibility of winning, always subject to the constraint that if they don't deliver, they'll be gone. You could never in a strong party have a system like the Democrats have in the US at the moment where Nancy Pelosi has led the House Democrats to four successive defeats and she's still there. Uh, so that's a sign of, a, of a, the <coughs> something not being right in the system. So um, the upshot, is, we want to argue, is that what you get is a weakened the parties with the diminished capacity to form governments and govern. That leads to more alienation of voters, which feeds demands for further reform, which then reinforces the problem. Now, it's important, I think, this is, this is a general argument we are making, and we, we, it's our view that it's, it's, it's reared its head just about every, in every democratic system. Um, Germany has always been held up as a kind of exceptional, exceptionally successful system. Um, it is a mixed system. There is a, there's a science so-called of dog breeding where the, the, the aim was to produce a dog that had the personality of a Labrador but didn't shed. And, right? and so this was the idea of, of a Labradoodle. Um, and in many ways, Germany was for, for, many, for a number of decades held up as the perfect Labradoodle. Um, that they had the mixed system, you have your PR, but you also have your single member district system. You produced, it, while not a two party system, you certainly had two very predictable forms of government, more or less uh, alternating in power, that produced what we think of as um, parties that are capable of, of developing broad programmatic policies, um, Volkspartien as, as they were known here. And um, so many people said this is the, so the German system is the sweet spot and that this is what we should all be converging upon. And indeed many countries have tried to copy the German system, but it, it turns out to be very difficult to copy, and, it, and so they end up with poodle doors rather than labradoodles. Um, and even in Germany, um, the, the system is starting to, to feel some of the strains that the other systems are experiencing. Why, why has the German system been so successful? 
Well, first of all, you've, you have a tradition of very strong parliamentarism because of the Weimar experience and the understanding of the, how enormously destructive it is for politics in the legislature to have a powerful independent president uh, or an independent chancellor. And that rather the, the, the leader of the executive must be uh, a strong representative of the, of the dominant party in parliament. Um, second, your, your, mem your single member districts are big. They're big and they're diverse and that helps produce stable parties. If you like the, 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 to think about it, this, in a, a genuinely well-functioning single, single member district system, what's really important is that the median voter in the district shouldn't be that different from the median voter in the country. So ideally, every district would have some urban voters in it and some rural voters in it uh, and some representatives of different ethnic groups in it. So that in every district you have people running for office who have to think about the interests of everybody in the country rather than a narrow slice of people. So the fact that you have big districts helps. Only 299 of them, they're more than three times the size of the districts in the UK, for example. This is a good thing. Um, that you have a relatively controlled system of candidate and leader selection, resisted by and large the pressures for direct election of leaders. I see that I know there's some of that in the SPD, but uh, nothing like the case in, in some countries. You, you know, we just saw in, in Britain, as I said, they've been messing up their system. We had last year a, a circumstance where uh, Jeremy Corbyn had a, a no confidence vote of 172 to 40 in the Parliamentary Labour Party, and three months later the membership re-elected him by 62 <coughs> percent. This is not a recipe for a party that is going to be able to govern um, if, if he stumbles back into uh, 10 Downing Street. It's always possible because in in politics, in the short run, you only have to be marginally less incompetent than the people you're running <laughs> against. Um, but he looks better than he should now because he's not in the position of trying to govern with a party with whom he largely disagrees on every major question. Um, then you have, in Germany, you also have budget rules, the independent central bank, and various EU protection agreements that limit the centrifugal possibilities in politics. And it's also all has been underpinned by the post-war corporatist deal between business and labor that has now begun to fray. In Germany, as elsewhere, we've seen and are seeing in real time playing out the impacts of globalization, uh, technology, and slow growth uh, with the creation of structural unemployment, whether it's in the east or in the deindustrializing cities in, in the west. Um, we've seen uh, going on with the German parties, many of the same phenomena that we're seeing elsewhere. First of all, the shrinking and fragmentation of the left, uh, largely reflecting the declining power and size of labor. And this means that traditional labor parties are less able to negotiate good deals for their shrinking memberships and also less able to protect uh, workers who are, who are no longer within their ambit. And as the, as the um, left parties uh, that used to come in in just about every European country, the, the left of center party would come in first or second, now comes in third or fourth, um, and we've seen this fragmentation uh, to other parties, then the, the right has, has also started to fragment, rather reminiscent, frighteningly in some ways, of, of the 1930s. And uh, as, you, as you see, uh, we've watched here, as the, the, the right of center party has moved to the center, partly to gobble up voters that have, have become available because of the fragmentation of the left, they then uh, can be outflanked on, on, their own, um, on their own right. Uh, and so you see the fragmentation on the right. I, I learned today that in 1986, 
Franz Joseph Strauss warned that there must not be, we must never allow a situation to develop where a democratically, democratically legitimate party can emerge to the right of the CDU. But of course, that's exactly what has happened uh, as, as the CDU has gone in search of voters in the middle. Uh, and so we've seen then fragmentation on the right as well. A collapse of that corporatist consensus, which depended on very high rates of, of growth and productivity growth. Um, the implant, even in Germany, which has been relatively immune from decentralizing reforms, part of the reason it took six months for you to get a government was that the, the SPD first had to take it to their national convention and then to their membership. And even the CDU this time around, I understand, had to bring the coalition agreement to the membership at the behest of the youth movement. And then not only did Angela Merkel have to do that, she had to publish her cabinet uh, selections in advance of their approval uh, of, the, of the coalition deal. So this is, is, as I said, nowhere near as extreme as in many democratic systems, but it's the same kind of pressure of trying to put grassroots control on the activities of leaders in, um, in, in the legislature. Um, and it, so it's worth now just, I think, taking a step back from these particulars and, and looking at it in a broader historical sweep. If we think back to the 1930s, when uh, you, had, you had Weimar here and we had other forms of, of, um, of proportional representation in Europe, um, that, the getting a big foothold in the legislature in those elections in the 1930s was, was an important part of the, the successful strategy of the rise of the radical right. In Britain, by contrast, because they had only two and only two parties that could survive, the Mosleyites, who in the, in the late 20s and early 30s had as many supporters as the Nazis had here, were, were, they never got a seat in Parliament, and they, and they were largely uh, ineffective. Um, and so this is one of the advantages of a, of a two-party system, is that uh, extreme groups like that cannot get a foothold in the legislature. If you think of the 2010s, there's an, an analogous comparison in that uh, you've, you get the emergence of, of extremist parties in just about every European system, but the UKIP, in 2015, UKIP got about 7 million votes in a PR system that would have given them over 90 seats in the House of Commons. They would have started to become a, a real force to be reckoned with. In fact, I think they got one seat. Uh, and, uh, and then Cameron messed it up by having a referendum. He didn't have to do that. Uh, you know, the, this is another example of succumbing to this pressure for direct democracy. Britain never had referendums until 1975. And why did they have the first referendum? Because Harold Wilson didn't want to deal with the fight in the Labour Party over Europe. So he said, we'll have a referendum. Uh, and I won't have to confront this. Um, and so um, Cameron was just playing out this, this same script. But uh, this is why referenda um, uh, are so bad for democracy. Because what we, what we have to remember about <laughs> democracy is that political parties are actually integral to the successful functioning of, political, of democracy because they bundle issues. So what do I mean by bundling issues? When you say you know, a political party has to give a broad platform, what, what you're really saying is that Everything they propose has to be discounted by every other thing they propose. So it's the exact opposite of pulling something out and saying, let's have a referendum on whether we should have property taxes in excess of 1% of assessed values in California. Voters say, no, we shouldn't, right? Without reference to what that means for the quality of the schools or the roads or whatever it is. Or should we shut down this airport in Berlin? <laughs> right? Uh, you, you pull that out and people can vote on that question without reference to the, the costs of that decision for every other decision that's going to be made. And so the function of political parties is to bundle issues. 
And when you start to disaggregate issues and allow voters to vote on one issue at a time, uh, you're essentially waging war on the, the core function of a political party. And so what, what you really want is a political party that will bundle issues in a way that can appeal to as many voters as possible over time. So this is, this is our, our argument that you get this with two large, strong, alternating parties or at least predictable parties or pre-election, predictable coalitions or pre-election coalitions. Um, because if they're two and only two, if you think about it, this way, um, if, the, if, they, if somebody doesn't vote for our party, they're going to vote for the other party. So you don't want to leave voters on the table. Because the, if it's winner take all and it's lose it, lose all politics, right? So that means that it, as you put together the coalitions to form your political party, you have big incentives to internalize the costs of you, the deals that you're making. Whereas if you have lots of parties, um, each party doesn't know who it's going to be making a coalition with after the election, and certainly not in the next election after that. So they, their main incentive is to maximize th what their membership wants, and if they make deals, to externalize the costs onto third parties. So you might well have business and labor making a deal for high wages and industrial stability and externalizing the cost onto consumers in the form of higher prices. Or farmers joining some coalition in order to get price supports for agriculture, again, externalizing the costs onto uh, consumers. So, it, but if, if you only have two parties, you have to worry about every voter that you're going to externalize costs onto. So instead, what you're going to think about is ways of internalizing the costs of the deals that you make as much as possible, or at least mitigating their effects on others as much as you can, so as not to make them available to the other party that's competing against you, uh, and then you lose everything. As I said, it's win or win all, lose or lose all politics. So that's why you're most likely to get programmatic competition in, in uh, these systems, because it's in the interest of both parties to articulate a general program that can give uh, most voters most of what they want most of the time, um, because that's the way you're going to be able to appeal to them. Now, some people say, well, but then the parties converge on the middle and voters don't get any choice. Actually, that's not what happens if you look at these systems. It happens on some issues. So if you look at the UK after the war, uh, they create the, the National Health Service in 1948. They implemented in 1948. They enacted in 1946. Um, and it's hugely popular. It's the, even today, I saw a poll the other day, the National Health Service is more popular than the Queen. Uh, it's more popular than the British Olympic team. It is the most popular institution in Britain. Ergo, neither party will touch it. They'll argue about how to fund it around the margins, but the core <coughs> commitment of the health service is untouchable. And even, even Margaret Thatcher, when she was rolling back the frontiers of the welfare state, didn't touch the NHS. So on some issues, they'll converge. But on other issues, they won't, because there won't be agreement on what, what the best way is to deliver for most voters. So you'll have a party probably following broadly Keynesian policies and a party following broadly supply side or market oriented policies. Or you'll have, in, you know, in, you'll have the nationalization and denationalization of British Rail three times in the last 100 years. So on some issues, you will indeed get policy alternation, but on the things that the median voter cares intensely about, you, they will converge. But uh, you know, why shouldn't they converge if the, if the, the policy is that uh, popular? So that's what we mean by programmatic competition. The bad is when we, we think about multiple parties and coalition government, precisely because coalitions have an incentive 
to externalize the cost. You satisfy the people in your coalition for right now. You give them whatever you need to give them, you know, whether it's six ministries and the finance ministry or uh, whatever it might be. You satisfy them by giving them what you need to give them right now to get your uh, government uh, together. And you let the future take care of itself. You will worry about the future <laughs> when it comes. Uh, you don't have any incentive to do anything different. That tends to produce clientelist competition, where you're, so you're giving the supporters of each group one for you, one for you, three for you, um, because that's what you need to give. And you don't think about uh, anything beyond the support of the members of the coalition. The ugly are, um, with the second half of my table, weak parties, where the leadership has, has lost the ability to articulate programs that its own backbenches will support because of things like the proliferation of primaries, who participates in primaries, the voters at the extremes of the party. So if you look at Donald Trump, for instance, in the Republican primaries, most of those primaries that where he won the nomination had turned out in the teens, 17, 18, 19 percent. Trump was in fact picked by 5% of the American electorate to be the candidate for the Republican nomination. And then, of course, he becomes one in a binary choice. So uh, you get weak parties, and the same thing goes on in the legislature that the Tea Party say, well, will we'll force the selection of very right wing candidates. Uh, and the same thing happens in the Democratic Party on the far left. You then get um, people sent to Congress that the leadership can't control because if they listened to the leadership and the, they did what the leadership wanted, they would lose their seat at the next election because somebody would primary them. Uh, so that's the idea of a weak party. It cannot, it cannot the leadership can't uh, articulate policies that the backbenches will support and they have very little control over the, the, the selection of the backbenches as well. Um, then you tend to get fragmented and intra-party competition. So the, in, in Latin America and many East European countries now, we have open list PR. So you get both the proliferation and the intra-party competition, which weakens leaderships, and you get the worst of all worlds. In Israel, we have um, PR, no, very low threshold now, three and a half, they just put it up to three and a half percent threshold and primaries, the worst of, uh, that is a, you know, a poodle door of the, of the a, pu a pure form of a poodle door. Um, so I just, let me say a little bit more about the incentives here um, that we're talking about, why it's good to have big, strong parties. One, as I've already said, that they, it forces everybody to discount everything they want by everything else they want. So the, again, just go back to Brexit. The Brexit, first of all, it wasn't that the pollsters got Brexit wrong. Uh, in fact, the median voter in Britain doesn't want to leave Europe. But the Brexit voters are more intense than the, non, than the Remain voters, so they turned out in higher numbers than the Remain voters. In fact, a majority, the, the polls basically had it right. A, a majority wants to stay, and a majority of both parliamentary parties wanted to stay. Um, so that's the one thing. But then the other thing is by, by putting Brexit uh, out there, this is the unbundling problem again. You know, it would be one thing to have a referendum on the basic rules of, of the game at, at the moment of a constitutional convention, but particular policy choices, it, 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 it says to people, you can think about leaving Europe without reference to the costs of this to the economy, without reference to the cost of this for job creation, without reference to anything. And, and of course, when people are campaigning then there's going to be a lot of fake news about uh, what, what the effects of this are going to be. Oh, we'll have 350 million pounds a week to put into the NHS, whatever it is. You, you, you don't have any, the politicians have no incentive to not misrepresent what they're doing because all they're trying to do is get this ball over the line this week, right? So. Uh, there's no incentive to, to discount choices by the other choices that people are making. And 
Uh, if, if voters are forced to do that, they behave very differently. I'll just give you one more example of this. About 12 years ago, I wrote a book about the repeal of the estate tax in the US, which was a big puzzle because that you can get, you can get 65, 70% of Americans to say, we should repeal the estate tax when fewer than 2% of them pay it. Um, <laughs> And, but, but what the more interesting point about it is if you, if you poll and you say, should we get rid of the estate tax? People say yes. But if you have a poll, should we get rid of any tax? People say yes. But if you say, should we get rid of the estate tax if it means we're also going to get rid of prescription drugs for seniors, then they say no, right? So this is elementary bundling, right? And, and single issue politics is an invitation to unbundle. So uh, that's why one reason big parties are good, internalizing the costs of the deals they make, I've already talked about. Another analogy is from, um, from the world of, uh, of industrial arbitration. There's one kind of arbitration that works like this. When business and management have a dispute, they each take a final position, they each take a position, and they can't agree, so they go to arbitration. The arbitrator comes in, the arbitrator does some fact finding, and then comes up with a decision, and it's usually, you know, it's not what either of them wanted, it's some form of compromise. The, the difficulty with that is everybody knows that's what's going to end, how it's going to end. So people take extreme positions in order to then give up something and appear to be being reasonable, right? We've all seen this. It's just like a shop jacking up prices in order to have a sale later, right? So there's a, a, one, one mechanism to defeat that is called last best offer arbitration. And the way last best offer arbitration works is that both sides must give their last best offer. And then the arbitrator has to pick one. They can't compromise. They must pick one. And the effect of that is exactly what you would predict if you think about it for a second. First of all, they tend to converge. Secondly, they don't engage in strategic misrepresentation of their preferences because the stakes are too high. If you take an extreme position, you, you've got to bet the arbitrator is going to pick the other side. So you won't do it. And so what, that's what we find in last best offer arbitration. There's much less game playing and strategic misrepresentation. And the parties tend to converge on something actually pretty close to one another and to what they think a person would regard as a reasonable settlement. So our argument is that competition against, among two big um, programmatic parties is more like last best offer arbitration because each party has to articulate a platform knowing that the voter is going to be in the position of that arbitrator. They just, it's the last best offer. There's not going to be a post-election negotiation. This is what you're going to get. Do you want it or do you want that? Uh, and there's no third possibility. And that creates the right incentives for the politicians in both parties. So that's why we want big parties that are capable of articulating um, large, um, large uh, programs that can appeal to many people. Another way of thinking about it is big, strong parties are sort of like marriages. They, they uh, are made, of course marriages fall apart sometimes, but they, people anticipate when they get married that they're going to stay married for a long time, maybe <coughs> even forever. They plan on that expectation and they therefore have a reason to building internal trust uh, among the groups that compose them. and. Uh, building a, a, a name for the future, being viewed in a certain way uh, by others, and so on. Whereas in coalition politics, it's more like hookups. You, you, this, this is going to work for us for now, and we have no idea what's going to work for us after the next election. And so we don't have any incentive to think about uh, that. Uh, th this, you know, we might you know, maybe we will have another grand coalition next time, but who knows? Look at Italy now. We don't know. Will there be a coalition of parties on the right, or will it be like Greece in 2015, where you'll get the far right and the far left 
You know, nobody knows. Uh, and so they can't plan for it, and they can't anticipate, and they can't develop policies that can produce um, uh, long-term arrangements. And then finally, um, when you have two big parties, uh, the opposition party is essentially a government in waiting, auditioning for power. They can't be in a position, if, the, if they want to get anywhere, um, of just taking pot shots at the government and doing nothing else. They have to be there as a government in waiting, showing voters that if, if and when the government screws up, here we are, we're ready to govern. So they have, they have every incentive to develop uh, programmatic policies in opposition that they're going to be able to implement in government. Uh, that's only true if you have not only big parties, but strong parties. So just again, to give you an American illustration, uh, where we, the costs of weak parties are that they can't actually command their members to do anything in support of the programs that they campaign on. So when the Republicans were in opposition, they voted 67 times that they were going to repeal Obamacare, um, knowing that it was going to be either um, not get through the Senate or vetoed by President Obama, when they actually get control of the House, they find they can't enact that because the party is so weak that the leadership can't actually get the backbenchers to do it. Um, so that's why we need strong as well as big, not just big. Um, so there it is in summary form. You get uh, with two big strong parties. The, in the UK system, unadulterated, which unfortunately now has been adulterated in more ways than I've mentioned tonight, but I'm happy to talk about more if people are interested. Um, with multiple parties, you tend to get wholesale clientelism. Uh, with weak parties, you tend to get retail clientelism, bridges to nowhere, bringing home the bacon to your constituency, and so on. And then with multiple weak parties, you get wholesale and resale clientelism. So what about reform? So reform <laughs> agendas are difficult because there's, there's this, this whole um, problem has been made worse by this basic misdiagnosis. People think there's not enough popular control of parties and politicians when actually there's too much. Uh, this is why uh, the subtitle of our book is going to be Saving Democracy from Itself. Um, it's hard because the beneficiaries of the status quo don't want to change it. Um, when you think back to the Italian referendum, it seems like ancient history now, given what's happened in Italy. But you know, Renzi, I didn't think all of the things he was trying to do with those uh, reforms were good. But a big chunk of what he was doing, was trying to do, was to reverse some of these decentralizing reforms, and of course, he got nowhere. Um, it's hard because often it's, it's starry-eyed progressives who push for these decentralizing changes. What you tend to find is that most instruments of direct democracy are dreamed up on the, on the naive left and then um, uh, basically hijacked by the cynical right. So this has happened with ballot initiatives, with primaries, uh, with many of these other instruments. Um, it's hard, I think, because of the misguided faith in PR. Uh, again, people, particularly on the European left uh, and Americans who are envious of the European left, have often said PR is better because it, it's, it leads to less inequality. Uh, our own view about that, which I haven't talked about now but can elaborate on if people are interested, is that depended on a particularly historical set of circumstances which is no longer there because it depended on uh, the left, the, the labor movement being more powerful and more effective and more encompassing of sectors of the population than is, is the case any longer. Um, but mostly it's hard because the direction that reform needs to go in is the exact opposite of the direction uh, that people are demanding. Uh, so that's why we're writing our book. Um, <laughs> but now you can all tell me why I'm wrong. <laughs>
Leslie Collard is my name. I was the Financial Times correspondent, Eastern Europe and Berlin during the Cold War. Now, my question to you, uh, Mr. Shapiro, is what your recipe might be to end the stasis in American politics. <laughs> is, is part of the reason that uh, a large section of the population feels they were given the, uh, the short end of the stick by whatever party was ever in control in America, or what was it? So you asked me two separate questions. One is what caused it, and then what's the solution? Yeah. Um, so I think that um, what caused it is, is similar to what's caused the uh, eruption of, of the far right parties in, the, in Europe, namely that as the left this is, as the left parties got weaker and disintegrated, many of the, the center-right parties shifted leftwards to gobble up those voters. And they, they didn't see any danger there because there's no longer an alternative. If you, go, if you think about the New Deal, many the sort of Averill Harrimans of this world, the noblesse oblige um, business elites and so on, said it's really important that we make sure that nobody gets uh, to the position of having nothing to lose but their chains because there's another ideo ideology out there vying for them and uh, that would be really bad. Uh, but once capitalism was the only game in town, they thought we can move to the suburbs and build more prisons. We don't have to worry about people, the people who don't make it in a capitalist system anymore. So I think you see the disintegration of the left, then the, the right of center parties uh, you know, as here moving to, to the center, but that creates, uh, it creates political space, which shows up in a PR system in the emergence of, of far-right parties, and in the U.S. system, in, pri in primaries and so on, these voters are now mobilizable for a hostile takeover attempt of a political party, and that's what we saw with Sanders and with Trump play itself out. Um, uh, and that's what couldn't play itself out with the Mosleyites in Britain in the 30s, and it's what couldn't play itself out with the UK people in the 2010s. Um, so because the parties, the British parties are strong, right? So weak parties are vulnerable in a two-party system in just the same way as uh, multiple parties are vulnerable in this. So I think that's largely what produced it. And so the, the, the solution, the, the solution is for the economic and political elites to wake up and realize that if they don't speak, you know, it, it's not what, what we, everybody keeps saying, well, there are these people with these extreme preferences. They don't drop out of the sky, right? The reason they emerge, that something produces them, the reason they emerge is that the economic system hasn't been addressing their interests. They see no future for their children. They see static or if not declining standards of living. They see their communities being uh, ravaged by drugs. And somebody comes along and says, only I can fix it. You know, and they, they see no reason not to, to try that because the system's not working for them. So that's, that's I think, uh, the cause of it, yeah. Yeah, um, Helmut Anhoy from the Hertie School of Governance. Are you essentially saying that we should all adopt a Westminster model of government? <laughs> am, I, am I essentially saying we should all adopt a Westminster model of governance? No. So I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm acutely aware of the crit critique of political theorists, which goes like this. It says, a um, um, fellow goes up to a farmer in Donegal and says, how do I get to Dublin? And the farmer says, well, I wouldn't start from here, Sonny. <laughs> right. So, uh, you know, and I I'm, I'm very much believe we have to start from where we are and work with what we have to work with. And so I think that the, the question in every situation, it's, it's not there's anything special about Westminster. And indeed, there's some bad aspects to the British system. The constituencies are too small, um, all the, and they're not particularly now when all the wealth is in London, there, there are many problems with that system. It's rather, what are the principles that made the Westminster system good? 
uh, when it was at its best, and how whatever system you're in, how can you move in that direction rather than a different direction? Uh, so um, as I said, you have to start from where you are. But basically, anything that strengthens parties is good, and anything that reduces the number of parties, provided it's not to one, is good. Uh, and so. And anything that, that makes parties able to function more cohesively is good. So, but you have to think about the system as a whole. People tend to think about one reform at a time. So for instance, this week, Hillary Clinton is running around saying, oh, isn't it terrible that the, that the electoral college vote lets the person with, with 2.8 million fewer votes become the president, and we should get rid of the electoral college. Without, any reference to what impact that would actually have, what it would increase the legitimacy of the president vis-a-vis um, -vis the legislature. Whereas a better reform is to say, in, in that particular instance, would be to go back to the system they had before 1824 when the presidential candidates were selected by the, parliament, the, the congressional parties. So that would make the president functionally more like a prime minister. Um, and would align the incentives of the president more with the incentives of the Congress. There's no constitutional object, obstacle to that. That's a feasible reform that could be done if people weren't looking in the wrong direction. So in every system, I would say, um, first of all, stop going the wrong way. Because one thing I didn't mention with these decentralizing reforms, they're almost impossible to reverse. Um, so once you, you go there, uh, you're not coming back. And so first of all, do no, don't go in the wrong direction. And then think about what would make the party stronger, uh, given where you're starting. Uh, you know, you, 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 you've got to start where you are, but at least you want to know which direction Dublin is in. So um, you can't, sometimes a Westminster system just wouldn't work. So if you have massive regional variation, uh, single member district systems won't even produce two parties. Um, so then you have to think, so then PRs may be better, but you want to have a, a very high threshold and um, other things to discourage small parties and so on. So that's more uh, the direction of what I'm saying. Yes, sir. Hi, Rand Ortner. I'm a fellow here. My question is, um, how do you make these constructs, uh, many of them are counterintuitive, how do you make it appeal to someone that's struggling to get by, doesn't have um, the kind of time to lend their sophistication to political ideas? And so the packaging, and you can see how very unsophisticated things can be very appealing. How do you begin to c combat that with these kinds of ideas that are so counterintuitive? Well, I think it is difficult, uh, and you, you, I think you largely have to focus on, on the, the people who are in the business of designing these systems and reforming them, um, and convince them that actually these reforms are making their jobs harder, not easier. Because the reason these people are struggling to get by is that the, the economy isn't working for them. Um, and what you're doing is putting po your, your ha politicians, I mean, look how hamstrung your new government is. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's not obvious at all that they, they're going to have the kind of freedom to articulate and implement policies that are good for the country uh, that they would have had even a decade ago. So, or now, um, you know, governments that, uh, enact protectionism, it's the flavor of the week, um, to satisfy a very narrow slice of, of you know, voters. I mean, here is, this is a good example that, you know, um, first of all, American steel workers' jobs didn't go, didn't go to trade. They've gone to technology. The US produces more than 70% of its own steel. Uh, the, these, these tariffs are not going to bring any of these steel jobs back, never mind. And they're going to be huge costs for the economy. So the fact that, that politicians stick themselves with catering to these groups isn't actually going to make it any easier for them to govern uh, and, to, and to put in place policies that are actually going to help the economy. 
So at the end of the day, I think those are the people you have to convince that what, what you're doing is actually just making it harder for you. Um, but it's a, I agree with you, there's a kind of pushing string quality to it. But uh, that is the nature of the beast. Yeah. Hi, Andrew Hicks, also a fellow here at the Academy. Uh, my question is about uh, with the bundling of issues within a strong two-party system. Um, that, in a way, requires a kind of rational, uh, rational calculus that you talked about of discounting X for the cost of Y, et cetera. Where do um, issues that are often referred to with the code word of family values uh, within American politics, how do they fit into that? That is to say, how do social issues figure within, at least within your talk, which is function as a kind of economic calculus of choice? Um, commitments that fall outside of, of, of broadly secular politics. So uh, I think you know, that's a very hard question. And what I would say about that, that is that politics works best when it's about divisible goods. Uh, so m most of the problem with all forms of identity politics is that it tends to be about indivisible goods. <coughs> and uh, the, the, I think the more, the, the sort of the underlying question beneath you is what is it that gives politicians the incentive to try and mobilize people around um, identity politics and indivisible goods? And I think it's largely when the, the <coughs> nation is, is not delivering in the economic sense. So it's, it's usually that identity politics becomes appealed to as a, as a kind of cultural shorthand or scapegoat, uh, to find somebody to blame. You know, it's, it's those brown people or it's those, you know, uh, un-American feminists. It's this group or it's that group who's screwing up the country. And that's why your life's not going well. Um, so it largely becomes, uh, and it, it, it's, it's what game theorists call cheap talk. There's very little cost to them, at least in the short run, of mobilizing people on that basis. And so, so I think that, that the worst thing you can do is design systems that encourage mobilization around indivisible goods. And that's why I think majority minority districts, it's a terrible idea. Um, uh, because it, it actually gives politicians incentives to mobilize on an ethnic and a racial basis. So the, the, the people sometimes say when I give this talk, oh, this is so paternalistic. You're talking about what's in people's interests, but you've got to accept their preferences and act on them. But the way I think about it is if, if politicians don't address people's preferences, don't address people's interests, they're going to confront their preferences and it's not going to be pretty. Because preferences are going to, the preferences are going to be driven in the direction of these things because it's always cheap to mobilize. It's easy to mobilize people around these issues. And so it's better to, to think about um, what will create a system will move toward a system where politicians don't have incentives. So it's in, in a strong two-party system, it's very difficult to mobilize people around ethnic issues um, because you won't, get, you won't win, right? There's just not enough of them. Um, so I, you know, and I think that, that, that that's how I think about that problem. Hans von Plötz, former German diplomat. Um, ugly things in dem democracy. Is money ugly? Pardon? Is money ugly? You didn't mention money at all. <laughs> so money, money is very bad for politics. And it's particularly bad in weak, in weak systems. Because in, in weak systems, money can be used to capture politicians, et, et cetera. It's another reason, by the way, I think primaries are terrible. Because if you have primaries, you just need more money uh, because you have a much longer election system. And you're going to have people funding or threatening to fund primary candidates as well. Uh, so yeah, the, the role of money, especially in a US system, is just complete disaster. And it goes, everyone says, oh, it's so important to have courts. Um, well, in the US case, uh, 
the main impact the court has had is to, in 1976 in a case called Buckley versus Vallejo to say that money is speech protected by the First Amendment, which is the single most destructive decision of the court for the US democracy. And it's meant that every time Congress has tried to regulate the role of money in politics, it gets pulled up short. But of course, if politicians need large amounts of money to run for office, they have to please the people who give them the money. Uh, and, and that you know, disproportionately benefits the wealthy and the well healed. With the arrival of um, internet and all that, um, some people said, oh, this problem is going to go away. And look how Obama raised so much money from tiny contributions. And this is great. Crowdsource funding parties, hip, hip, hooray. But it turns out uh, that the people who give money to parties are, are uh, more extreme even than primary voters. And even the people who give small amounts to parties are more extreme even than primary voters. So it's a, it's a hugely unrepresented and disproportionate uh, the extreme subset of the population that gives money to politicians. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's a very, very bad. Uh, no remedy. Yeah, sure there is. The court could, in the US case, the court should say, money is not speech, it's money. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not protected. But you'd have to have a different court. Thank you for uh, your lecture. My name is Hannah Shem, a student, uh, a college student uh, of government at Harvard University. So my question is, like specifically in the U.S. context, uh, how do you think uh, we can rebuild the capacity for parties? Given that, uh, like, how can we what? Sorry. Re rebuild the capacity of parties, like if assuming that we have like weak parties in the states. And could you also elaborate on why you consider like U.S. to have uh, weaker par weak parties? OK. Thank you. So the US has weak parties for a number of reasons. One is it has more, first of all, it was designed by people who didn't believe in political parties. They were completely against political parties and, until they operated the system for a few years. And they quickly changed their mind. So Madison and Jefferson quickly learned they weren't going to be able to stop Hamilton if they didn't form a party. Um, and then they got. They got religion pretty fast, but by then they had unfortunately had already written the Constitution, which is not friendly to strong parties. First of all, because of the separation of powers. Secondly, because of the proliferation of other veto players in the system, the courts, um, the bicameralism, the Senate rules, that's not written in the Constitution. But all of these things mean when you have lots of veto players, you're basically creating many points at which people can extract rents for their assent uh, to, to any policy. One of the reasons Obamacare, this is, speaks to money as well as veto players, one of the reasons Obamacare was such a bad law and so vulnerable was that they, they had ex only the exact number of votes in the Senate they, that, to pass a bill. They had exactly 60 votes. And Joe Lieberman, the senator from my home state of Connecticut, also happens to be the state um, where it's the center of the insurance industry. And the insurance industry had given millions of dollars to Lieberman's campaigns over the years. And Lieberman had said he would support the bill. And then 10 days before the vote, he said, we not, I'm not going to support it unless you take the public option out of the bill. The public option was the thing that could eventually have led Obamacare to morph into a single payer system, Medicare for all. And it was the thing that kept the, the other competitors honest. So there you see both the, the problem with lots of veto players and the problem with money coming together. And of course, they took the public option out of the bill because they wouldn't have been able to pass it otherwise. So we have a lot of veto players. And every veto player can extract a rent. Uh, for anything uh, that when they needed to pass the bill, greatly weakens the party. The presidentialism greatly weakens the party because the reason Pelosi can survive there is that she doesn't really get blamed for all these losses because they blame the talk of the ticket or they say, well, the party on the Hill always loses seats in the midterm. 
uh, or they say the unpopular results are due to the uh, president. Uh, so there's, there's, no, there's very little accountability. Um, so all of these reasons contribute to party weakness, but by far the biggest one has been the rise of primaries because primaries takes candidate selection out of the hands of the leadership um, completely. It was, it was great to get rid of the smoke-filled rooms and all that. There shouldn't have been the smoke-filled rooms and the party apparatchiks. It should have been the leadership in the House choosing the House candidates with a lot of local constituency input. This is something they do pretty well in the UK, and I think something you do pretty well here in Germany, actually, in your single member district. It is nominally a bottom up system, but it's pretty constrained by party committees and so on. In the US, it's a complete free for all, and uh, it, you get candidates that are completely uncontrollable by the leadership, but who also can't coordinate with one another because they come from very different types of constituencies. Uh, so often they can't coordinate enough to get rid of a leader, uh, but the leader can't whip them to vote either. So you get what we've got. Uh, so what, what could be done? Uh, as I said, I'm all for starting where we are and peace rule reforms. <laughs> I mentioned one, I think, if the congressional parties was to select the presidential candidates, that would be an improvement. Another would be, we're never going to get rid of primaries in the US. I think it's impossible. It's a, just politically not thinkable. But you, I think the, something like the following could be thinkable. One could say that the result of the primary is only going to be counted if the turnout is 75% of the general election turnout the previous round. And that, that would, I think the, that you could sell that politically because I think the vast majority of people don't understand that minuscule numbers of people turn out in primaries. So they think it's more democratic. But if you say, fine, if 75% turn out, uh, and vote, we'll count the primary. If not, we won't. Almost no primary candidate would get elected under that, you know. <laughs> and that, that is, I think, it's a way of, of framing the reform that you could imagine selling, I think, you could, because it highlights the fact that this isn't actually more democracy, but instead it's, it's contracting out candidate to selection to a self-selected group of activists. Why don't we conclude this part and then move on to a uh, more informal conversation next door. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.